So today we're going to discuss a somewhat bizarre discovery in the realm of biology, and something that kind of pushes the boundaries when it comes to the definition of life. And the very important question of what is life, or I guess, what isn't life. Because technically, even today, the definition of life is still lacking. But generally, when it comes to trying to define life, we usually focus on very specific biological processes, such as, for example, the ability to self-sustain, the ability to process signals, the capacity for organization, metabolism, growth, adaptation, reproduction, response to stimuli, and homeostasis. Or I guess in general, life has an ability to process, act, react, evaluate, and also evolve through growth and reproduction. But the definition of life has been evolving for a very long time. As a matter of fact, one of the first attempts to explain what life is and to provide scientific evidence for what it could be came from the famous Schrodinger, the same guy behind the quantum physics and the cat in the box. And he actually introduced the idea known as a periodic solid. Some kind of an object containing chemical information, very likely inside the chemical bonds, that's then able to use this chemical information to essentially do all kinds of biochemical reactions. And intriguingly, he proposed this in the 1940s, way, way before DNA was discovered and way before we knew anything about genetics. But because of his conference and his book, this encouraged other biologists to pursue this idea of genetic inheritance. And though the hypothesis behind this existed for several decades, the actual role of chemistry in reproduction and the discovery of the famous DNA molecule did not happen until 1953. This was the famous James Watson and Francis Crick discovery with the experiments conducted by Rosalind Franklin. They essentially found DNA. And so since then DNA formed the basis for life. Or essentially for many years researchers believed that most living things, or I guess all living things, are supposed to contain DNA. But around the same time something else was discovered in regards to something that was at first believed to be just some kind of a toxin. And that's because in the 19th century a lot of researchers realized that some diseases, for example rabies, seemed to be caused by particles that were much smaller than bacteria and were potentially not alive. And because they were toxic in nature, in order to explain them, researchers eventually named them after the Latin word for a poison. They now became known as a virus. And so until 1935, they were explained as unusual chemicals. Chemicals that were toxic in nature. But then, Wendell Stanley and his colleagues found a way to crystallize one of these viruses, in this case the tobacco mosaic virus, revealing that they seem to contain a package of complex biochemicals with researchers also discovering that they seem to contain DNA as well. And though eventually in 1946 Wendell Stanley won the Nobel Prize for this, here by 1940s the conclusion was that viruses, despite DNA molecules, were still probably not alive. Mostly because they seemed to lack essential systems necessary for metabolic functions. Or basically they lacked the ability to conduct biochemical processes, and mostly relied on the host, in this case by literally kidnapping the cell, in order to perform all of this. And so despite DNA molecules, viruses were seen as chemicals, not organisms. Or they kind of existed on the border between chemicals and life. And mostly because they depended on host cells for survival, with some researchers describing viruses as essentially living a kind of a borrowed life. With all viruses basically depending on their host cells for survival, and in order to do everything, life usually does. And so because they could not replicate by themselves and could not actually do most of the biochemical reactions without the host, even today viruses are generally believed to be some kind of a gray area between living and non-living. But exactly what they are is still uncertain. But today we're going to discuss a new discovery that basically makes everything even more mysterious. Because here researchers discovered an organism, if we can even call it that, that seems to be just a little bit more complex than a virus, but is still much simpler than any bacteria, and does require a host to do most of this stuff. But intriguingly, it seems to be a part of a family known as Archaea. And so let's discuss this new discovery in a bit more detail, focusing on this new study by Ryo Harada and a team from Japan. And here the title basically explains most of this. This is a cellular entity. An entity that's somewhat difficult to explain, seems to contain a very very small genome, but seems to be part of Archaea. And so once again the question here is going to be, 
Okay, so is this life, maybe? Or is this, once again, something closer to viruses, and thus just some kind of a chemical molecule? But to start, let's talk about the discovery first. And here they were not looking for viruses or even archaea, they were actually studying something else. This. A super tiny plankton, Catharistes regius, that actually belongs to a species known as dinoflagellates, a tiny single-cell organism that's usually able to photosynthesize and that can also move around. But in this case, this dinoflagellate also has an intriguing symbiosis with certain types of bacteria, which is what researchers behind the study were initially trying to study. But while sequencing the DNA of this organism, they discovered a very unusual loop of DNA that made no sense, which suggested that something else was living inside and something we've never seen before. Mostly because the DNA in this case did not fit into any category. And while well, eventually they discovered that this genome is relatively short, only 238,000 base pairs. That's actually surprisingly small, considering that some viruses can often contain anywhere from several hundred thousand up to 2.5 million. And so if this was some kind of a parasite, it was something we've never seen before. And so following a very thorough investigation, they eventually discovered exactly what this is. And it's now known as Sucunarchaeum, specifically Sucunarchaeum mirabile, a really strange organism representing the closest entity to a typical virus, but that still seems to contain genes and even functions from typical archaea, the ancient bacteria that we've discussed in many videos in the description, and archaea that sometimes in the past, approximately 2 billion years ago, decided to conduct a certain symbiosis with some other bacteria, eventually forming, well, basically cells that we are made out of. In some sense, according to some biologists, we are also archaea. But instead of complexity of human cells, this is literally the opposite spectrum. This is pure simplicity. Here we seem to observe an extremely specialized organism that over billions of years of evolution seems to have dramatically reduced its genome to the point where it does most of the life-related stuff through its host and not by itself. For example, it seems to completely lack metabolic pathways and can only conduct metabolism inside the cell when it takes over some of the machinery. But it still contains a way to self-replicate, similar to a typical archaea. At the same time, just like archaea, it contains very large membrane proteins on the surface, much more complex than a typical virus. And so here, strangely enough, this archaea evolved to be almost virus-like. Most of its biological functions, including metabolism, can only be conducted when it becomes a parasite infecting a host. And just like a typical virus, most of the genes inside of this cell seems to do only one thing – self-replication. And such an extreme dependence on the host for pretty much anything has never been seen in anything but viruses. We don't actually know of any parasite out there that seems to be as simple. Or at least a parasite that we can still define as life. And this of course creates a major problem for biological definitions. Back to that original question. So what is life? Because technically we can still consider this to be life as well, as it seems to have come from other archaea. Here it does seem to have a connection to a lot of other archaeal lineages, and does contain certain genes that viruses usually don't contain. For example, unlike typical viruses, Sukuna archaeum still possesses genes to create its own DNA replication, including things like ribosomes, messenger RNA, and transfer RNA, whereas viruses usually just hijack this from the host. And it's also able to produce proteins involved in forming the membrane, specifically forming the membrane that eventually forms a house for its own tiny circle of DNA. So basically it has some functions that most viruses don't seem to possess, but lacks the majority of functions that we usually expect from archaea. But genetically, it still seems to belong to the archaea family, and so in some sense, this is really our distant cousin. Like super distant. As a matter of fact, its chromosomes, and specifically their circular shape, resembles genetic material from bacteria and archaea to a high degree. And because in this case the host doesn't seem to get anything from this organism, Sukunarchaeum seems to be a perfect parasite. It enters the cell, it steals a lot of metabolic pathways, and then it leaves following the replication. And so the question here is of course, okay, so is this alive? Because it sure seems to be extremely virus-like and is not really able to do much else. Despite the fact that back in the days, it potentially was a living archaea with a lot of other functionalities. It just it seems to have lost its abilities over time. And so here the only difference between a virus and this organism 
is just the fact that Zuconarchaeum can replicate, but a virus cannot. But neither this organism nor viruses can sustain themselves without a host, which does create a kind of a new unusual problem for a lot of evolutionary biologists. I mean, for now at least, biologists are assuming that this seems to be life, but that also means that we might need to redefine viruses once again. Either way, Zuconarchaeum mirabile is definitely one of the most intriguing and most unusual entities, biological entities, discovered in the last few decades. And I'm sure many papers are going to be discussing this for years to come. And right now, no other parasites exist that seem to be as specialized and as simple as this. Now, we did discuss some other parasites in the videos in the description that, for example, found ways to survive without breathing or without doing a lot of other complex stuff we usually associate with life, but never this simple. This is honestly just bizarre. And I'm sure it's going to lead to a lot of discussions and potential redefinitions of life once again. And actually, this also creates additional questions. And the obvious question here is, okay, so how many viruses actually used to be bacteria or archaea previously and eventually became so simple that nothing was left behind? Because that's kind of what it looks like happened here, and chances are this happened many times before and potentially even changed some archaea into just pure viruses over time. I mean, for all we know, maybe this is actually how many viruses were formed. And if so, this is a groundbreaking discovery that's definitely going to lead to some major reinterpretations of the idea behind life. But that part, though, is just an assumption. Right now, there is no evidence that other viruses used to be bacteria or archaea yet. Either way, we'll definitely come back and discuss this more in some of the future videos, especially once there are some additional discoveries. Thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads, and can DM me directly, or by joining the channel membership where you can find early access and some other extra footage. Alternatively, you can buy the Wonderful Person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.